good morning and welcome. How is everyone doing this morning? Excellent. That's what I like to hear. Today is going to be, I'm hoping, a, uh, a great day to be able to share some knowledge. And I was, I was reflecting on this a little bit last night. And I must say, when I was reviewing my slides, this is one of my favorite talks to give. Uh, first of all, there's a ton of pictures involved, which I, which I enjoy putting together the presentation. But for me, it's a very pragmatic, very, very uh, take-home message type of presentation, where I'm hoping that the information that I'm able to share with you today, you'll be able to put into practice um, by the time you leave um, for the break. So fingers crossed, that goes, that goes well. They've asked me to stand still today, so that's going to be a bit of a challenge. I'm used to walking around and, and, and moving a bit, so we will... Uh, We'll see if I can stay planted at the, uh, at the podium for this. So before I begin, I would like to disclose and, and acknowledge some of the funding that I've received over the past couple of years for some of the research that I've been working on. This is through the Canadian Institute of Health Research, the University of Western Ontario, the Canadian Association of Occupational Therapy, and also the Canadian Occupational Therapy Foundation. Without the support, I would not be able to do the research that we do and make some of the advancements that we're currently working on. So for today's agenda, I have three things in mind. First of all, I'd like to provide you with an overview of what occupational therapy is and what the role of the occupational therapist is. I'd like to take you through a virtual tour of a home and take a look at some of the hazards that are present and we can talk about strategies to overcome some of these hazards and look at the assistive devices that are available commercially for you. And finally, if there's anything that I'm asking uh, of you today, it's that I would like to be able to empower you. Okay, I want to, you to be able to leave today to be empowered, to be able to live your life to the fullest, so that you're able to do the things that you want to do and that you need to do. Okay, I need you guys to be able to engage in those occupations that you find meaningful in your lives. And if there's anything that you take away from this presentation today, that's the one point that, uh, that I'm hoping to, to get across, that you're able to do what you want to do and that you need to do and that there are creative solutions to be able to make things work. Nothing is impossible. So the role of the occupational therapist. What is an occupational therapist? Well, we're a healthcare profession um, that works with enabling people to be able to do the things, as I said, what you want to do and what you need to do. And these are things such as everyday tasks. That may be getting up in the morning, getting your teeth brushed, getting out of bed, getting into a vehicle and driving to a doctor's appointment or to visit the grandkids, what have you. Okay, we work with a number of individuals with different disabilities, different diseases, different levels of impairment, and we work with healthy individuals as well to be able to make their, their lives a little bit easier. Um, many of the tips and strategies that I'm going to be sharing with you today are not, um, not just for individuals with Parkinson's disease. Many of them apply to individuals, again, who do not have Parkinson's um, or have no impairments uh, whatsoever. And it's just to make things a little bit easier and to be able to allow people to engage in those activities that they really want to. So again, take home message, we want to experience life to the fullest. Uh, this is a collaborative uh, profession, so we're working with not only other occupational therapists, we're working with clients, we're working with their families, their caregivers, working with other health professionals such as physical therapists, nurse, nurse practitioners, physicians, movement disorder specialists. Um, and the way I approach this is that the client is the expert. So you know yourself the best. When I'm working with an individual, I go to them first for their opinion. How are things working for you on this day? And it's very important that you have a voice. So when you are out working in the healthcare profession, um, you're speaking with your physician, you're speaking with either OTs, PTs, speech language pathologists, remember that you truly are the expert and make sure that your voice is being heard. So what approach do, does occupational therapy take? Well, we, we, it really is like a holistic approach where we're looking at a three-pronged system. So we have the person, we have the environment, and the occupation. For much of today, I'm going to be focusing on the, uh, the occupation and also on the environment. And we talk about the different tasks that we complete in everyday life, and these can be broken down into three main tenets. We have self-care, productivity, and leisure. So self-care, again, is getting up, getting your teeth brushed, getting dressed, getting washed. Productivity misconceptions just not about going to work it's engaging in those occupations that you find meaningful okay this may be gardening this may be playing with as I said the grandkids this may be going scuba diving whatever you want to do okay and then there's leisure activities that come into play as well again we take this holistic approach and the goal is to try and get those three circles all aligned in the middle and that middle spot is where we have health and well-being 
So for much of today's presentation, I'm going to be talking about hazards within the home and walking you through the home. Here's a picture of my house. Uh, we've just been there for around two years. I like to move around a bit. And, and they tell you, uh, when I was going through graduate school, they tell you to talk about what you're passionate about. And I'm truly passionate about fixing up homes, about being creative, about finding solutions and seeing things that other people may not be able to see. So as Dr. Jenkins can attest to, this is my, this is my third house that I've owned and, and fixed up, and much to the chagrin of my wife, um, this is actually the final house that we are finally, finally staying in, and I think I finally got it nailed down on what, we, uh, what we're looking to do. But I'm going to walk you through the house today and take a look at some of those hazards that's there, look at the risk factors, and hopefully provide you with some very practical solutions that you're able to take home with you. Um, these solutions are going to be including recommendations to make. Some of them are going to cost you nothing. Some of them are going to be much, uh, much more costlier, and it'll be up to you to decide which ones you're able to uh, and, and would like to implement. I'm going to be looking at some of the uh, adaptive equipment that's available, as I said, for you commercially to purchase, and also some larger scale items such as some home modifications to make. First thing that I should mention, because I almost tripped coming out of the front door this morning, nice place to start. Um, is making sure when you first come up to the house, making sure that the entryway is clear of debris. I have two young children, a four and a six year old, and I swear they each have 15 pairs of shoes. And like to leave their socks on the stairs. I don't know if anybody can relate, but A, I almost fell down the stairs this morning, and B, once I uh, was outside of my house, we have some uneven uh, paving stones that we're thinking about getting replaced. Um, so the first thing to go home, check to make sure that you have a nice clean walkway to be able to get into the home, that the surface is nice and even, that there's nothing to uh, trip over, or if there are any loose rocks, that you're able to, uh, to fix them and maintain them properly. So again, the first place we, we come up into the home, we're entering the stairs, making sure that the stairs are clear of debris. This includes not only kid socks, as I mentioned, but if we're talking about the outside, making sure that the snow is removed, the ice is removed, making sure that we do a quick sweep to uh, ensure that all the leaves are off. If it is in the winter, as we do live in Canada, and we have just had a quite a uh, tremendous winter to top uh, none other, uh, making sure that we have some good tread on the stairs so that they're not slippery. This can be added either with, uh, you can go to Home Depot or Rona or any of the sort of the big box stores and buy metal tread that can be anchored down so that it will uh, give you quite a bit more friction and grip on the stairs. There's also other options to have like a sandpaper type grip that just is, is stuck down on the stairs to again increase that friction so that uh, you don't slip potentially having carpet on the stair as, as well so that you can uh, soak up some of that moisture so that it doesn't freeze and turn into ice right on the stairs. If stairs are not an issue, potentially having a ramp involved if you're using a scooter, if you're using a walker um, or a wheelchair. Now the issue with the ramps is that the longer they get, uh, the more costly they get. And the rule of thumb is that it should be a 1 to 12 ratio for length to height or vice versa, height. So every inch that you have to go up, you have to come out 12 inches. Okay. So the typical rise may be 24 inches. So that would be 24 feet you would be needing to come out. So it gets quite, uh, quite expensive because you're going to have to not only build the ramp, but there's also this idea of upkeeping the ramp. So again, clearing the snow, clearing the ice. Um, in instances where it's potentially above maybe 24 inches, 30 inches, you might be better to get a stair lift, which you can see on the bottom, uh, bottom slide there. It's a much smaller footprint, although the cost does increase considerably. You're looking at having concrete poured, having electrical run. The nice thing with the, uh, with the lifts are that they can be covered so that it's a little bit less uh, maintenance in terms of snow removal, etc. Regardless, whichever one you decide uh, to implement, if you, if you need to implement it at all, make sure that you speak to the building, uh, the building contractors. Make sure it's to code. They have certain guidelines. There's universal guidelines. There's codes that have to be followed. Um, and that, that 1 to 12 ratio is the minimum. Okay? You may still find it quite difficult to go up that 1 to 12. It still may be a bit too steep. So think about changing that to a 1 to 15 or a 1 to 18. So every inch you go up, go out every 18 inches. And again, that's something to potentially try out. Go to some of the local public buildings that have ramps installed, see what you like, see what you find easy to get up and down. Continuing with the stairs, if there are carpeting on the stairs, make sure that they're, secured fashion, uh, that they're fastened securely. 
Um, this may be having just to, again, a no-cost solution, just having to put them in with a hammer and a, and, a, and a tool, or you can get those rods that keep the carpet in place. If you have a front entrance way, which has um, tile, you may want to have a rug there to, again, soak up that water so that it's not slippery. But again, rugs can become frayed. Edges can curl up, eat very easily to trip on. So make sure that you have a double-sided tape underneath or perhaps a non-slip resin backing that you can see in this, uh, in this picture that you can buy quite inexpensively from a carpet store so that the carpet doesn't slide out or that the edges don't, uh, don't curl up. When you are on stairs, make sure that you always have one hand free so that you can hold onto the railing. Okay? Might be a good idea to have railings on both sides. If, for example, your left side is stronger than your right, when you go to walk up a set of stairs, you'd be fine if you had a railing on the left-hand side. But what happens when you come down? You're facing the other way. You would have to hold on with your right hand, which is your weaker hand. So if you do have the space, uh, it might be a good idea to put railings on both sides of the stairs. And again, doing things such as laundry. If you have laundry on a second floor or in the, in the basement, um, rather than carrying a laundry basket in two hands walking down the stairs, consider getting one where you can just fold up like this picture shows and carry it in one hand while still having a firm grasp on the railing. Another thing that I like to recommend, and we have one of these in our house, is a, an organizer that goes in the closet that unfortunately my kids don't use as frequently as I wish they would, uh, to store shoes. So rather than having the shoes in the middle of the way that you can potentially trip over. Um, also, when you go to get the shoes, you can put them up on a higher shelf so that you're not bending over. Anytime you bend over, again, you may lose your balance, um, may become a little bit dizzy, and potentially lead to a fall. And again, quite, in, quite inexpensive, can be picked up at you know Walmart, Zellers, um, you, you name it. Uh, I think Target has them quite easily to, uh, to access. If we move our way into the living room, we talk about moving the furniture so that there's lots of space. Okay? All too often, I've worked with clients who swear to me that they use their walker and they use it all the time. And we sit and I, and I don't say anything and I introduce myself and I come into the house and sure enough, they have their walker with them, which I think is great. And they, they, we go into the living room and they sort of go off to the side and they park it in the corner. And then they walk without the walker in between two couches, an end table, over top of a phone cord to sit in their favorite chair. Um, that's when a trip is most likely going to happen, when you don't have the walker and when you're trying to navigate around obstacles. Try and spread out the furniture so that the walker can stay with you at all times, so that you have a nice clear path, so that you can make a nice arc around the chair, back into the chair, and then we'll talk a little bit uh, later about how to use the walker appropriately to make sure that the brakes are on and that you're not using the walker when to uh, sit down, but really hold on to that chair and lower yourself slowly down. Avoid rushing. Another major issue when it comes to trips and falls are people rushing for telephones, people rushing to get the door. People can wait, let them wait. Okay? There's technology that you can purchase that will help you avoid having to rush. Portable phones, carry one with you. You won't have to be rushing to get the phone. It can sit, if you use a walker, it can sit in your walker basket, it can sit on the end table, have multiples. I think we have one that has five or six headsets connected to just one base, and you can put them all throughout the house. Not only do you have them available to answer the phone, if you happen to fall, you have a phone with you so that you can call for help. Okay? They also have a, a machine where you can set it up at the front door so that you can see who's at your door when the doorbell goes. And there's an intercom associated with that as well. So that you can say, you know, just push the button, I'm here, I see you, hi Bob, I'll, uh, I'll be there in just a minute. And they can wait and you don't have to worry about rushing. There's also features that if, again, a little bit more costly if you're doing some work on the house, where you can program it so that it actually unlocks the door with a push of a button. Just much like when you're living in the apartment building, somebody buzzes up, you can unlock that main entrance. You can get that um, for your home as well. And I mentioned about preventing um, people bending over so that we uh, reduce the risk of a falls. Any chance you can get to use long-handled materials such as a, a broom and a long-handled dustpan, rather than bending over to sweep up the dust and dirt, just grab a long-handled reacher or a long-handled dustpan to sweep up and it prevents you having to, to bend over and potentially um, prevent a fall. Again, in the living room, making sure that the furniture is the right height. Okay. Ideally, what we would always like to see is that the hips maintain above the knees. If your knees, if you sit down on too low of a furniture and your hips drop below your knees, it's going to be increasingly difficult to stand up and get out of the chair. Okay? If you have some furniture that's worn a little bit, there are pieces of, in, of um, 
material that you can buy. You can use plywood or there's things specifically designed for this that can go underneath the cushions to make that firm so that you, you minimize that sag so that again your hips maintain uh, above the level of your knees. There's also furniture risers. So these are um, more or less blocks that have an indent in them that you can actually put the legs of furniture on top to raise them up so that you are at a proper height so it helps facilitate you transferring in and out of um, the chairs. Other options available, super poles, they're called. So these are floor to ceiling poles that can either be firmly bolted in or are also a pressure fit. So I know some people have concerns about bolting um, and not only the cost, but if you're living in a rental suite or what have you, about making changes to the home itself. These can be pressure fit from the floor to the ceiling and provide a nice firm structure to pull up on. They come in many different, uh, different uh, sizes with either a horizontal bar coming out. This one has a little bit of an S, uh, S curve to it, provides different structures for you to hold on to when you're both standing up and sitting down, and it can swing out of the way. Other options you see, um, there's one that can fit underneath an armchair. It has a nice table so that, again, you can put that phone, if you're having a drink of water, your magazine, what have you. Um, there's also the standard lift chairs that I'm sure we're all familiar with that you can purchase, where it actually provides that extra bit of lift by, by pushing you up, and the whole chair actually lifts you up. And there's other ones, if you don't want to go that route, where it's, it's a mechanism, and it's a spring mechanism, where you sit down, the spring locks into place, and this is what we're looking at on the, uh, the bottom right hand of the screen there. Um, when you un unleash, unleash it, the spring will release and it will help you stand up and provide that extra little bit of force to make standing independently just that much easier. In the kitchen, who here, here's a question, who, who here has scatter mats in the house? Everybody, okay, everybody close your eyes and I'm going to ask that question again. <laughs> who here has scatter mats in the house? Yes. How many people have been told not to have scatter mats in the house? Yes. I have them. We like them. I've tripped on them. My kids have fallen on them. My daughter runs around like it's a marathon in the house and she slipped on them, but we still have them. As an occupational therapist, I'm not here preaching at you, telling you, you must do this, you must do that. These are just recommendations and I hope you appreciate that that you are your own person, you have to make the decisions, I'm providing recommendations for you, but ultimately the decision is up to you um, to live your life the way you want to live your life and be able to accept the risks that you're willing to accept. Okay, So I would recommend highly to discard the scatter mats because they do become quite slippery if you don't have a backing on them and the edges become quite um, fringed as you see here quite easy to trip on even if you use something as a, a double-sided tape or even some duct tape so that the edges don't curl up makes it much safer for you if there's spills <coughs> if there's spills make sure you clean them up right away because again anytime there's liquid on the floor it becomes quite slippery make sure that you're organizing your cupboard so that your most frequently used items are front and center no matter how many times I give this talk, I'm still going home and climbing up above, I did it yesterday, climbing up above the fridge in the very top cupboard to get a pan that I use probably three times a week. I should be taking my own, my own advice. So sometimes the, the easiest things to do is just to sit back, reflect, and really think about the, the small changes that you can make that will potentially make a big difference um, for you. Because when you're, again, when you're up on a chair, potentially on a stool, uh, the increased risk for uh, uh, for a crawl just continues to continues to escalate. Talking about stools, if you do use a stool, um, try and get one that has arms or something to lean on at the front so that you don't fall forward. You can place it up against a, potentially a wall or a cupboard so that the stool doesn't tip, doesn't slide out. Make sure you have nice rubber feet so that it doesn't slip. Um, reachers. Reachers are fantastic. They come in many different sizes with many different attaches. These are called long-handled reachers. Again, it's to help you so that you don't have to bend over to pick things up. You drop a sock in behind the dresser, you can use them for any number of things. Word of caution, the longer the reacher, and you may think, I'm, I found this reacher, it's you know this long, I'm going to be able to pick up anything with it. I can reach into the very back cupboard, what have you. The longer the reacher, the more force or the more effort it's going to take for you to be able to lift whatever it is you're trying to lift. So for example, if you're trying to get a box of cereal out of the back cupboard and you have a reacher yay long, should be able to do it with relative ease. If you go for the one that's twice as long, it's going to increase that force in your shoulder considerably. 
Okay, and just, so just just things to things to consider. Try and make sure that the reacher is used, um, the the one that you purchase is is for the purpose intended. Okay. Also, I would recommend these are relatively inexpensive. I think ten to fifteen dollars. Make sure you have multiple use uh, multiple reachers so that they're available for you to use. Keep one with you in the walker. Keep one in the living room. Keep one upstairs in the bedroom. Because if it's not handy, if it's not there, we're not going to use it. Other options, um, pens. Pens which are, which are weighted, or you can have a, uh, a weighted sleeve to help with, with tremor. So if you're writing checks, if you're writing notes, reminders in the kitchen, um, that's certainly something that's handy to, uh, to have that does help with the, uh, with the tremors. Weighted utensils and cups. Again, this helps, uh, helps with uh, tremors. Other ones that are displayed here is a food bumper, so that's on your bottom right. So again, helps with being able to scoop food up off of a plate without it falling over the side. There's insulated thermos cups uh, that not only keep the beverages warm, but also have a lid on it to prevent spills. We have weighted utensils to, again, just help facilitate the independent feeding. Um, and that one on the right-hand side in the middle is a heated soup dish. So it keeps the food nice and warm uh, as you continue to eat if you're a little bit slower. When you eat, it provides the opportunity to still enjoy a nice meal without the food getting cold. Other options in the kitchen to consider, we have a finger guard. So again, if you enjoy cooking, I thoroughly enjoy cooking, which my wife appreciates. Um, her idea of cooking, and I'll have to show her this video because um, she knows I, I tease her sometimes, is craft dinner. That's, the, uh, that's her idea of a good, wholesome, wholesome meal. Um, whereas I'm on the other side of uh, sort of the egg, eggplant parmesan. So if you, do, if you do any bit of cooking, consider getting a finger guard. So again, this is just a plastic guard that you can see on the bottom left-hand corner of the screen that goes over the finger so that you are using sharp knives. If you do have the tremor, potentially dyskinesia, that you're still able to engage in that passion of cooking that you enjoy in a safe, in a safe manner. We also have a kettle tipper. So again, rather than free pouring the, uh, the hot boiling water out of the kettle, it can sit in this, in this tipper, just sits on a pivot, and you can just pour that cup of uh, hot water in a safe fashion without having to worry about spilling it. And we have a pot, uh, a pot guard as well, so that the pot or pan does not spin on the, uh, on the top of the stove. Comes in quite handy. Again, these are things that anybody can use. I spoke about non-slip mats for underneath the rugs. Well, we also have non-slip material, which is called Dyson which is able to be used under bowls, under plates, under anything more or less for you um, to bent, prevent it from slipping on the counter. You may want to do just the opposite. If you have a big heavy pot of water, rather than walking across from, depending on how your kitchen is set up, rather than walking across the floor with the pot from the sink to the, to the stove, if you're able to keep the pot on the counter and slide it, do something as simple as rolling up a, uh, a di or folding up a dishcloth that's not wet and put it on the counter, put the pot on the counter and then just slide it across. Okay. Uh, we have rocker knives, that's the bottom left hand corner picture shown, where again rather than your traditional knife, the rocker knife is less sharp on the end, so again if dyskinesias are involved a little bit safer and less effort is needed to use the rocker knife and again you just rock back and forth and it tends to cut the food quite, uh, quite nicely. There's different devices such as a cutting board that will clamp the food down for you so if you choose not to use the, uh, the finger guard this is one way, uh, one way around that is you can lock the food right into the cutting board and again there's some that have the knife right on a pivot so again you can feed the food through as you continue to chop. A little bit more of an expense but a nice luxury is an automatic pot filler. I suppose it's not automatic, you still have to turn it on, but it's right, above the, uh, it's right above the stove so that you don't have to worry about carrying the pot with the full, um, full thing of water in it. You can put the empty pot on the stove and fill it up right there. Moving into the bedroom, talking about assistance with transfers on and off the bed. Um, again, we have these super poles that come. Here's one that you see that has a horizontal pole extending out from it. Not only can you hold on to the vertical pole, you can also have some leverage by holding on to that horizontal one. They do lift up and swivel out of the way, which is quite nice. Other ones that you can get, which are a little bit more portable, is called an M rail, and that's your middle picture here on the bottom. These have legs that slide run right underneath the mattress and get attached to, so it's not going to fall out. And again, this helps with bed mobility, so if you're having issues with turning and maneuvering around uh, in the bedroom, it helps you not only stand up because you can push up from it, but again, it helps you, for example, turn over. 
in the night. We have a bed ladder as well if you are having issues with sitting up. This can be attached to the base of the bed or the foot of the bed, and you can use that to pull yourself up and just have a little bit more mobility. And when you are transferring on and off of the bed, make sure that if you do have casters and wheels, make sure that the bed is locked. So easy to have these come unlocked and the bed scoot across, across, the, uh, across the floor and you end up unfortunately on the ground. Also want to make sure that we have a firm mattress. I like using a, uh, again, firm mattress. My wife, not so much. She likes the soft. I find with the soft, I, ha I myself have a difficult time maneuvering in bed, turning over. Um, and again, I, I roll around a lot when, I, when I'm sleeping. And again, having that ability to get into a comfortable position um, is very important for a good night's sleep. Um, one thing that might uh, prove to be useful is silk sheets to use. Just make sure you don't slip off the other edge of the, the bed, but it does help you with your maneuverability, whereas the cotton seems to be a little bit more, uh, more friction involved. There's also what's called a blanket support. So again, lifts the blanket up so it, it attaches at the end of the bed and it just goes under the mattress. And there's just these arms that you see in the middle picture here where it holds the blanket up off of your feet so you're still covered, you're still warm, but it's not that restriction um, and allows you to have a little bit more mobility. I would suggest incorporating a motion-activated nightlight. All too often individuals may, uh, may experience a fall in the middle of the night. You're sleeping, all of a sudden you realize you have to go to the washroom, you wake up, you're still a little bit groggy, you get out of bed, and you don't see the cat on the ground, the pair of pants that you've just taken off. Um, it'd be great if you just had a light that would come on automatically and light the way. Talking about dressing in the bedroom, we have a number of different clothing that, uh, that you can purchase. There's, there's elastic shoelaces, so again, rather than bending down and having to tie up your shoelaces, they can remain tied and they're stretchy, so you can just slip your shoes on and off without having to, uh, to use Velcro if you choose not to. Uh, there's wear button up shirts. They're a little bit easier to put on than the ones that go over top of your head. You know, if you're having issues with buttons, there's a couple of things that can be done. Either you can change out the back of the buttons so that they're Velcro, so that they can just snap on with the Velcro and easy to take off. There's other shirts that you can buy that have magnetics or magnets already incorporated into them. I think they're called Magna Ready shirts, and they're around 40 or $50, so they're a little bit... Uh, a little bit more money than your standard shirt, but again, you won't have to worry about doing up the buttons. Or there's a button pull or a button aid um, called a button hook that you see on that uh, on the bottom there. I haven't yet, but that sounds like a great idea. Um, and I knew, do know that there are other issues with um, things that you can buy with zippers to help do them up and putting a ring on the zipper to again have it one-handed but I'm not too sure how the, uh, to do up the, uh, that actually bottom clasp with one hand. You said Under Armour. Yeah, I brought up a few Right, well, I will be going home today and looking that up. Thank you. See, I'm learning just as much um, today as you guys, so I love doing these things. I'm always, I'm always learning from my clients. This is fantastic. Um, so we talked about the elastic shoelaces. We talked about the shirts using, using a dressing stick. So this is a stick with a number of different sort of implements on the end that have different hooks that you can use to grab and to pull, to, to pull the pants up, to grab the suspenders that are on the floor rather than, again, bending over to pick them up. And there's also a sock aid, which is that second pitcher in from the left. Again, rather than bending over and trying to struggle by putting on that sock, first of all, if you're able to sit on a nice firm surface, cross your leg over so that your foot is nice and upright and you can put on your sock that way or we can use a sock aid where you actually, it's a piece of plastic material that you can mold it and put the sock over, throw it on the floor more or less and it has strings that you can hold on to and you pull your sock on to your feet. Quite handy to, uh, quite handy to use, a little bit of a learning curve but they are quite good. Moving into the bathroom and talking about transferring in and out of a bathtub Number one thing, please do not pull up on toilet paper rolls or onto um, towel bars. These are not secured properly into the wall. They're meant to hold toilet paper and to hold towels, not to hold body weight. Too many times I've seen them ripped out of the wall. And if you think about in the bathroom, you're in, a, you're in a confined space with likely sharp cupboards that you can hit your head on, potentially go into the bathtub, which is a hard porcelain. Very dangerous. You may um, the floor could be wet with moisture from the shower, etc. So make sure that you are using grab bars. Number of different grab bars available. Hire a contractor to install them if you're not comfortable installing them yourself. You see on the far left hand side there, it's a, it's an anchor, and this is one of the most secure anchors. Uh, 
you, you can get rather than just putting a plug in, but it still can be ripped out of the wall quite easy. The idea is that it's just spring loaded, you put a hole in the wall, you push it through, it springs open and it prevents um, the bolt from coming through. But again, with the amount of force that we're putting on it, if we're using it to lift ourselves up, it's so easy to be ripped out of the wall. So make sure that it is being um, installed into a nice stud and again, have a, hire a professional to do that. If you're traveling, they do have suction cup uh, or if you're renting potentially as well and you don't want to um, go to the trouble or sometimes you have a marble shower and you're afraid of cracking the tiles, rather than not using a grab bar, they do have devices available that suction cup onto the wall. They are quite good, okay? But again, it's just that there, so, some of them are, some of them aren't. There are ones that you can get that way that um, they can hold up to a couple hundred pounds. The issue is, is that not all of them are and you can buy some at stores that um, that are not necessarily full grade. So I would go, if you're going to buy them, go to a medical store to buy them. But my point is don't trust them because they can come undone. Um, and check them, I would check them on a regular basis, like daily almost before I use them, give them a good pull. Bottom line, I would prefer and I would highly recommend you not use the suction cup unless you have to. Um, it's great if you have to, and again, if you're going to a hotel or something and, and it's not uh, not available for you, you can bring one, they're lightweight, they pop on in no time, um, but there's always that chance that they can fall off, so thank you for, for bringing that up. When you do go into the shower, make sure that you have three points of contact. Okay, we can see on the bottom right hand side, there's a vertical bar leading into the, uh, into the, the tub area and also a horizontal one across the back. So whenever you're entering into the bathtub, you wanna make sure you have three points of contact. One being your foot, one being the, the grab bar itself, and then as you take a step into the bathtub, you wanna be holding that, that, potentially that back one on the wall. Okay, so three points of contact would be the safest. We also have what's called a tub mounted grab bar. So again, this is more of a portable device that gets clamped on and depending on the setup of your house and of, of your bathroom, you may not have room to put super poles or to put various various bars and whatnot. Um, this can just be attached over top of the tub itself. Again, potential for it to slip off, but if you if you tighten it up quite good and check it on a regular basis, it's certainly better than having, having nothing. Um, there's also a what's called a tub transfer board. Okay, so this is something that sits right across the, the bathtub. And there's only a small uh, lip typically on the left-hand side along that, back, along that back wall. So just be careful. Again, these could have the tendency to slip. They are, they are pressure fit, um, but again, better than nothing. And the idea is with these is rather than stepping into and over the bathtub edge, you would sit down on the edge and then swing your legs over. So again, minimizing the chance of, of a fall. The best option, in my opinion, if you have the room, is having a tub transfer bench itself, and that's what you see on the far right. Here you have a back support, you have a handle that you can use for helping to reposition yourself when you're on the board or on the bench. There's four legs, two firmly planted within the tub and two planted outside. Again, same idea is that you sit on the edge and you swivel your feet and sort of scooch over and that prevents any chance of you falling by slipping into the tub. Whenever you do have the tub, make sure that you do have a non-slip mat in there as well. I should mention, I just saw on the picture, having a handheld shower, very, very handy as well. Not only does it help you uh, get washed when you're se seating down, you can and take it off and you can test the temperature of the water to make sure it's not too hot. Uh, but you can also use it for cleaning, cleaning the soap scum and that, which could build up and become quite slippery as well. Number of different lifts, if you're looking to get more into the bathtub rather than just to take a shower, there are lifts available that you can sit on and can lower you into the tub itself. The one on the top left is air driven. Okay, so more or less this cushion is blown up with a compressor. You can sit on it, you then release a valve and it lowers you into the bathtub. A Little less stable in my opinion, than some of the firmer ones, um, which you see on the, the top right. I believe this one's uh, powered by water. So again, it uses water pressure. You would sit on it. This model happens to have a swivel seat on so that you can, you can sit on the edge and it actually moves. I don't know if you can, this, this area right in here, um, it shifts back. So a little bit easier with the, uh, with the transfer. And then again, you push the button, it lowers you into the tub and then is able to raise you back up. Um, again, another option that is becoming much more popular these days is to do a, do a step in so that they can actually modify your bathtub. So if they take a chunk out, which you see on that bottom left hand side, the before of a standard bathtub, 
and on the right hand side now we have a cutout so that it's quite easy to to just walk in to the bathtub or again if you're looking for that full bath experience they have ones where they have a door that swings in you then close the door you have to wait while the tub fills up um, some concerns with that for me from a safety standpoint you're in the tub your hot water there's going to be a lot of pressure against that door that if you need to get out in a hurry um, it's going to be difficult very difficult to open that uh, open that door and plus you're going to have to sit in there waiting for the water to uh, waiting for the water to drain down one important thing to consider is when you're when you're doing the uh, the bathing and, and shower routines is the temperature of the water um, I personally like a really hot shower the issue with that is when I'm done I am absolutely exhausted because the heat takes a lot of steam and gusto out of you so it may be a good idea that if uh, if you're like me you like a really hot shower to either tone down the water temperature a little bit or if you know that you have something coming up if you have a doctor's appointment in the morning or you're going to somebody's graduation in the morning you have to get up early shower the night before Okay, make sure that you're not too tired when you're showering so that again that you don't slip but potentially shower the night before so that when you wake up you're rested and you have the energy to be able to get up get dressed and do the really important things that you're looking to do to go to a graduation ceremony for example other options that are available in the bathroom for showers is again having a shower chair so a nice spot to sit rather than standing again anytime you're seated you're in a much more stable position especially when watery water and slippery tiles are involved if you don't like the idea of having a shower, uh, shower chair you can have one that's attached to the wall it's like a bench and the seat just folds down very aesthetically pleasing as well you can get showers that are already preformed and have a seat these are great um, the one point of caution I will say is I tend to find that the seats are a little bit low so remembering back I suggested that we always want to make sure that our hips are above our knees I find these ones um, depending on what size you get the, they can be a little bit low and often they're sloped forward to let the water drain off so again if we think about that we're on a slippery surface slanted forward and you're a little bit low again could cause cause you to uh, slip other things plan ahead I already talked about this shower the night before adjust the temperature to avoid fatigue but avoid bending they have things such as pop-up drains so rather than bending over to put a plug in the drain this one you just have to push down you can do that with a long handled reacher with one of your dressing sticks whatever whatever you have uh, they have different implements available to help you get washed so again this person's cleaning their toes with a scrub brush on a long handled um, a long handled device transferring on and off the uh, on and off the toilets again we're looking at different uh, different orientations of super poles of grab bars it's good to have one that's horizontal we used to be able to put them on a, on a diagonal a little less force that you're able to create if you're pulling up on a diagonal uh, now we're recommending that they be placed horizontal so that you really can get a good firm grip and push up to help you stand up off of the toilet make sure that you have the right height toilet as well um, toilet that's too low will be harder to get up I think that's on my next uh, one of my next slides moving forward but there's a number of different ways that we can talk about by raising the toilet up you can have a raised toilet seat by adding that uh, preformed seat on top that can add four or five inches you can also add a section that goes underneath the toilet to raise the entire toilet up so that you are using the standard the standard seat looking at grab bars and that as I said make sure that there is a horizontal bar that you're able to push up on there's also what's called a versa frame and this is that uh, third from the from the left here and this is a frame that gets bolted on to your standard toilet through the back toilet bolts and again provides a nice firm structure that you're able to push up on and there's other other um, handles that you can get that attach right to the wall that again flip up out of the way depending on the size of the bathroom so that you still do have that mobility that may have to be potentially push, uh, positioned beside the beside the toilet uh, in between the shower so in order to be able to gain clear access in and out of the shower you may want to just flip that up out of the way here we're talking about the uh, the right height toilets so you can purchase a toilet that's called a right height toilet they're a little bit taller than the standard models or as I was saying we're looking at having a, a, a raised toilet seat which you can see in that middle picture over here so again adding that four or five inches you have to be careful some of these are bolted um, right onto the toilet bowl itself <coughs> which you can <coughs> pardon me which you can see on the right hand side it's like a clamp that you would tighten down um, that particular model on the right hand side has arms which is nice so I like the fact that you're able to push up 
My concern with these are that if you don't have e bilateral or equal strength on both sides and you're pushing more on one side than the other, you're going to create a little bit of a lever action and that can potentially tip over or come off. I would prefer if you're, if you're having that, I would prefer to see you use a VersaFrame instead because the legs, if we take a look back, the legs attach right onto the ground. So a nice firm, there's no chance of you, of you um, tipping at all with this. So again, just different things to consider. And again, if you are going with the right, uh, with the toilet, uh, the raised toilet seat, I would prefer you have one that is able to clamp on. There's other ones, such as the middle one, that just fits on nicely. It's nice because it is portable. Um, it gives you that flexibility that if you have company coming over, you just take it on and off. You hide it in the bathtub. You don't have to worry about it. Um, and if you do need it, you just pick it up and put it on quite nicely. Whereas the other ones with the clamps, a little bit more work. You still can do that, but it is a little bit more work to be able to do so. The bottom left-hand uh, picture is an idea with uh, where you raise up, where you put a section underneath the pre-existing toilet to raise it up. Again, a little bit nicer, a um, little bit more aesthetically aesthetically pleasing. We talked about scatter rugs. That goes true for the bathroom as well, having that bath mat, which is nice because um, if there is any moisture, if you do have condensation, rather than having the condensation around the toilet, which could be quite uh, slippery, I would prefer to see this. Um, but just realize that it is there, that it is a potential tripping hazard. Make sure that you have the double-sided tape um, on the bottom to help keep it in, keep it in place. Looking at mobility, um, if you're unsteady, consider using a cane, consider using a walker, potentially moving to a wheelchair. Want to make sure if you do use either a cane or a walker, making sure that it is the right height. So when you're when you're being uh, fit for this, if you, I know a lot of the canes are very easily adjustable. Um, try and make sure that the handle comes across the crease of the wrist. Okay, so when your hands are uh, or your arms are at your side, make sure that the handle of the cane is right at your wrist so that when you are using it, you have an approximately 15 degree um, bend in your elbow. That goes true of the walker as well. Okay, so make sure the handles are approximately at your wrist so that you have a nice 15 degree bend. And when you're using the walker, make sure that you're using it appropriately. I alluded to this a little bit earlier. A, make sure that you take it with you wherever you go, and B, make sure that you're walking within the walker frame. Often I see people with the walker way out in front, and if they do trip or they do stumble, um, it's quite easy that the walker's not going to do you much good. It really has to be quite close to you, and that you're really trying to walk within the frame of the walker. So if your feet are pretty close to the back wheels is what you're, what you're looking to do. Um, other things to consider is whether you're using a rollator walker, so those are the walkers with the four wheels, or more of a standard walker that, that doesn't have the wheels. The, the rollator walker um, gives you the flexibility to be able to carry things so that you do have a basket in there. Also provides you the opportunity to take a rest. Again, if you use it properly, you can put the brakes on, turn around. You can use it to have a bit of a rest, regain some of that energy. Um, and again, just I, I would caution you not to use it as a wheelchair. I've seen people do this as well, where they sit on it and they're being pushed by their by their caregiver throughout. Very easy to tip over if you hit a uh, crack on the sidewalk, for example, or a little bit of uneven ground. They're not meant to be used as transfer chairs. They are meant to be used to provide a bit of a bit of a rest opportunity for you to have that to have that seat there. Um, if you're using a cane, make sure you have a good rubber clip to have the increased friction. If you're using it in the winter time, they have other cleats that can be attached on, which dig into the ice. You can see that picture here on the right-hand side. Sort of flips up out of the way so that if you're transitioning indoors to uh, outdoors, you can just flip it down, go ahead, walk to the car. When you're getting back in the house, just flip that up again um, so that you're not obviously damaging the floors. The, the picture on the, uh, the top left, we're looking at what are called comfy hips. And this is like a, um, almost like a football uh, girder, I believe they're, they're called, and they have pads. So that if you are prone to falls, this really does prevent you um, from potentially breaking, breaking a hip uh, if you do fall a lot. They've come a long way. So before they used to be quite bulky and it was quite obvious that you were wearing these. I've been to many conferences where the representatives are wearing them and I didn't even know they were wearing them. They were in a nice pair of slacks. Um, so they've really been able to, with technology, minimize the amount of padding that's actually there. Um, and they really do work, uh, work quite, quite well to diminish the force to really help prevent any, uh, any chance of breaking a bone if you do happen to, uh, happen to fall. A little bit more walker, uh, walker safety. When you're using the walker to stand up, make sure, first of all, I would say put on your brakes um, and do not hold onto the walker and try and stand up. It's very easy to be tipped over on you. What you want to be doing is pushing up 
from whatever surface you're on. Once you're standing up, grab onto the walker, give it a second or two to, to sort of get your bearings, get the fogginess out. Sometimes we have a change in blood pressure uh, that makes us a little bit dizzy when we go from sitting to standing. Once we sort of get things figured out, then we can release the brakes and move. And again, as I talked a little bit earlier, want to make sure that you have that walker with you at all times. Um, so make sure that there are the space permits that. So moving, moving end tables, moving couches, position the furniture such that you're able to do that. Um, even moving into your bedroom late at night, make sure that you have a spot sort of set aside for the walker right next to the bed, rather than if you can across the uh, across the way, so that you're not parking it. Um, walking across the room without the walker, getting into the bed. Again, you get up in the middle of the night, the walker's not there. You have to somewhat stumble across the room to get to the walker, and that's where a fall may, uh, may in fact happen. One of the devices that we have... Yes? Oops, we have a microphone right behind you. Yeah. Oh, the, the picture that you had in the last slide uh, that you spoke about the underwear with the padding against falls, the, yes. name, the name of that, please? Comfy Hips. Comfy hips. Now that's it. Again, that's a name brand. Um, there are a number of different brands that you can get. I'm not, I just happen to be familiar with that one. I'm not saying that's the best one by any by any means. It's just one that I am uh, more familiar with. Um, and I know that there is a rep uh, representative, I believe, local in the in the London area. Um, and then that's C O M F I H I P S. I think it's just all one word. So this is a, and I'm just better check on the. Uh, on the time here. I think 50, okay, 10 minutes. Um, with, the, uh, with the walker or with a cane, um, there's something that you can use, which is it's a visual cue and it's a laser beam. This happens to be called a mobile laser. It's by a company out of the United States. And we've recently completed some research looking at its impact on gait, on, on somebody's ability to, to walk and what it does. And we find that it actually and all it is, it's a laser that can be turned on and off. It can attach either onto a walker or onto a cane, and it projects a red line on the floor. And especially if you're having experiencing some difficulties with freezing, it has showed some promise to help you uh, get out of that freezing episode or prevent it altogether or minimize the amount of time that you're in that freezing zone. Um, it helps increase step length, we found. Some um, evidence also suggests that it will help with velocity, so it'll speed you up a little bit, help with positioning. So again, this is something that we found that we weren't quite expecting, is that in, in a small study that we looked at individuals using this with walkers, um, when they weren't using the visual cue, the walker was quite a bit out in front of them and they weren't using it quite properly. Whereas with the laser cue there, it seemed to bring them closer to the walker. So even if the cue itself wasn't doing anything for them, it seemed to be placing the walker and themselves in a better position so that they're a little bit safer than if they were to stumble. And it also decreased the amount of time it took to turn. And this is an example of the data that we collected. So this is on a pressure sensitive mat. So we had people walk 20 feet or I think this study was around 10 feet forward, turn around and walk back. And we have pressure sensors that pick this up. And this is what we're seeing on the bottom diagrams is a picture of the footsteps. So without the cue on the bottom left, we see a number of different shuffling steps to begin with. And as they turn, they are continuing to overlap and they had quite a difficult time turning. That's without the cue. With the cue on, so with, the, with them looking at the laser cue, see the footsteps increase. So the length is a little bit bigger and going around that corner, it was a much smoother process. The other device that, uh, that we're just starting to research, and I believe there are a couple of um, students here from Dr. Jessica Gron's lab. One is a uh, postdoctoral fellow, and the other is an undergraduate student. Lucy and Krisha, are you here? Oh, they're in the back. Very good. Thank you for coming today. If you have, a, I'm going to put you on the spot. If there's any questions that people have about uh, about auditory cueing, I'm going to direct them to you afterwards. <laughs> but um, auditory cueing is another one. So rather than just use the visual cue, because with the visual cue with that laser beam, if you're, we, we've tested it inside, it seems to work. Again, there's, it works for some people. It doesn't work for all. So it's not, a, it's not a cure all. I want to, I want to say that again. Some people found it made a tremendous difference. Other people, um, other people, not so much. Um, there's also this idea of auditory cueing because the visual cue, once you get out in the sunlight, it may be quite difficult to see. So if you're out in community doing, uh, doing your grocery shopping or whatever, it may not be that useful. Versus the auditory cueing is lis listening to music. Okay? Studies have shown that listening to music helps improve your gait, which I think is fascinating. Uh, 
not only listen to any type of music, but music that you are highly familiar with and music that has a high groove. So it makes you want to move has shown that it actually does make you move a little bit, uh, a little bit faster. So whereas the visual cue was more about helping you increase step length, the auditory cues seem to be a little bit better at increasing velocity. Evidence also suggests that there's some improvements with cadence, with freezing of gait, and also decreasing the amount of time it takes to turn. Now, how am I doing on time? We have a couple minutes for questions. A oh, couple minutes for questions? Okay, so the last slide, I think, I'm gonna skip through a few. I didn't know how far I would get, so I'm just gonna skip through a few here. Where to purchase these? Um, again, these are just some examples. They are not all examples by any means. Um, but where to purchase some of the equipment and tools that we were talking about today. And this is in Sarnia. Medical Motion has some. Motion specialties are quite good to work with. Shoppers, home health care. And also, if you're looking to go online to look at some of these items, um, Patterson Medical has a pretty good website. I've listed it here, pattersonmedical.ca. Again, I'm not an advocate for any of these. Choose whichever company you wish to deal with. There's many more. I just happen to be familiar with these. One thing that I will say to be careful of, A, shop around. Okay, These devices will cost different amounts of money at different stores. And also make sure the store that you deal with is, is, is open to you being able to come in and potentially try out. Some of the stores that I have listed here won't let you try out the assistive device. You have to buy it and then get it home. And if you don't like it, sort of too bad, you're, you're stuck with it. Whereas other stores may allow you to rent it. So if you are able to rent it, it may be a good idea to rent it first. Um, see if you like it, especially with some of the things like the bed rails that are easily to put on um, to help you with the mobility. Maybe you start out with a super pole beside the bed and it's not quite right for you. It's not the quite height or it's not, it's not working, and you switch to an M-Rail, which is the one that slides underneath the mattress, a little bit portable, et cetera. It has to be a good fit for you, okay? Bottom line, I think end of, end of today, I would like you to walk away to be empowered, to be able to know what's out there, to know that you can go and live a, live a full life and do the things, again, that you really want to do and do it in the safest manner possible. So thank you very much, and I'm going to take questions uh, at this time. Sure. Yes. Doctor, I'd just like to um, mention about the re reachers. Yes. To stay away from the one that folds up. In co it's compact. It's great. But when you fold it up, I dropped mine one day, and it took a gouge on my leg. Oh. So it's a warning to you guys to be very careful with them. They, they do can do damage. Thank you. That's, a, that's very important. Yes. Okay. Yes, so you do have to be careful, and especially the ones you're right that fold up that may have sharp edges where they do come apart. Thank you. Is there any assistive devices for to prolong the ability to drive longer? Yes. So could I actually maybe have my presentation back up? Now this is not my area of expertise. I did. I wasn't sure how much time I was going to uh, going to take, so I will go through um, just a couple here. Um, here we are. Um, so recently with the School of Occupational Therapy, I'm a faculty member there, we have a, uh, a new director within the past two years. Her area of expertise is driving. She has completed some research on driving as it relates specifically to Parkinson's disease. So I'm just starting to begin a relationship working with her on this. So again, I'm not um, fully versed on all this, but I will certainly let you know what, what I know. Um, some of the devices that help with mobility to get in and out of the vehicle um, that we do have, there's, there's a, handy, a handy bar by Stander, um, which is on that top uh, right here, that can actually go into the, the latch on the door that provides a nice sturdy surface for you to be able to push up on to get out of the, uh, to get out of the vehicle. On the bottom left, there's a seat belt puller. So again, if you're having difficulty with rigidity, and with a decreased range of motion. So being able to twist around and grab that seat belt, they do have like an extension, uh, which you can see there. The issue that I've heard with this is they don't always stay where you want them. So uh, somebody that I was talking to, a driving rehab specialist, suggested that you use duct tape to attach, uh, to attach it so that it doesn't, uh, doesn't slide. Um, there's another device which we're pointing to there, which, which gets attached onto the, uh, the car door itself that again provides some leverage. I'm a little bit cautious of that one just from looking at it. I don't know how you would prevent the door from shutting if you're, if you're pulling on it the wrong way and I wouldn't want the door to give way and to have you fall. Again, it's, it's an option, it's there. I wanted to present all options um, for you, but just be, just be aware that just because a device exists doesn't necessarily mean it's the best for you and that it will work for you. 
Um, so you really have to do make an educated, um, an educated decision on which devices to use. The other one on that bottom right, we're looking at a uh, swivel cushion. This is used when you, if you have leather, it's not too bad. There's that decreased friction so that you're able to transition and sort of swivel into the car seat. But if you have cloth and there's quite a bit of friction and it's hard to swivel, um, these pads have um, sort of like ball bearings that will swivel on it so you can sit on it and then the whole pad will swivel to turn you into the car. Um, for driving specifically, some of the devices, um, the sort of high tech and low tech, this is more for if you're buying a new vehicle. And we recently purchased a new van. I was talking to Dr. Jenkins on the way here and I, I couldn't be happier. So again, these things aren't necessarily um, specific to Parkinson's, but they make driving a heck of a lot easier. One of them being a backup camera. I couldn't do the things that I do with the van I backed in today and I swear I was around two inches from the uh, gentleman's bumper behind me, and I couldn't have done that without the backup camera giving me that, that sight of view. So again, with the rigidity, with the decreased range of motion, rather than having to look completely behind you, see if anything's there, the backup cameras do have quite a wide angle. There's also for passing, um, when, cars, when cars go to pass you, there's indicators that light up if somebody is in your blind spot. I love this feature. I will never buy another vehicle. Um, that does not have this. It makes things so much easier um, to use to tell if somebody is in your blind spot and knowing when to pass or not. And on the far right, we're looking at, again, in-car technology that alerts you that if you're having issues with vehicle positioning, um, quite often with Parkinson's disease, there are visual deficits that, uh, that may come into play that impair one's ability to judge how close you are to a given object, how fast things are moving in relation in relation of space. And again, this provides um, a warning that you should break uh, if you're approaching an object too quickly. And again, it gives you that extra little bit of time to react and apply the brake, or some of the new vehicles also have the brake that if you're so close, it will actually apply the brake for you. Now again, these are things that you, I don't believe you can add necessarily to a vehicle, um, but if you are in, in, uh, in search of a new vehicle, I would certainly highly recommend you purchasing one that has these available or things that you can sort of retrofit to your current vehicle that may help. Um, the top right, we have a panoramic rear view mirror. So again, rather than uh, doing the blind spot check and having to turn around, um, this will give you a much more fuller view of what's behind you and what's in the, what's in the blind spots um, without having to look back. The bottom right hand side, we have a um, uh, what's called a smart view mirror. And if you can see on the top right hand of that mirror, actually we're just one over on the bottom right hand corner, right over here. Um, we have a smart view mirror and this area right in here, if there's any vehicles in that cutout of the mirror in here, you know that it's not safe to pass and that they would be in your in your blind spot. And again, that's just taking a quick scan with your eyes rather than having to do the full turnaround. Uh, not only does that come into play when, it turn, when we're looking at range of motion and having difficulty potentially with rigidity, but also with what's called set shifting. So again, focusing your attention back and forth between different, uh, different stimuli can be somewhat impaired in Parkinson's disease as well. So this is just a quick glance. Yep, there's nobody in that part of the mirror, so there's nobody in my, in my blind spot. And the final one here that I have uh, listed is what's uh, called lane, lane maintenance standards. There's no actual term for them. What I found out earlier uh, yesterday is these, this is actually a plumbing tool that if you um, lose a nut or something in a pipe, it's a magnetic end that sort of extends out and you can reach into the pipe to grab it. What they're doing, and this is from a driving rehabilitation specialist, is they're flipping them upside down. They're being, um, the magnets attaching onto the hood of the car. And if you're able to line those standards up with the, um, with the lane markers, it will allow you to stay in your proper lane, um, which is pretty neat. And again, some, some of the research that uh, Dr. Klassen has, uh, has looked at suggests that individuals with Parkinson's tend to drift over to the left into oncoming traffic. And again, it has to do with that visual, uh, visual perceptual deficits that may, be, uh, that may be present. So those are some of them. Again, I'm certainly not an expert when it comes to driving, but those are some of them that may um, may help aid in, in maintaining an, an adequate driving uh, performance to make, make you safe on the road. Doctor, you mentioned uh, using the laser light to that it helped with longer steps and better turning around. What's your experience with the same thing happening or not happening with walking poles? I don't have an experience, like the, the poles themselves without, do you mean the pole that's just a straight pole or do you have one that has a horizontal piece that you step on? No, the ones that are like, like your ski poles. Right, I don't have any experience Urban, urban poles, I guess they're called. Right. Is that, a, sorry, I don't have any um, experience with those, so I'm not too, uh, oh. 
just one sec, we'll just get a microphone here. I use mine and they definitely give me a, a big step, a graceful, even, big step. Thank you. I'm going to take a look to see if there's any research on that as well, and, and that would be interesting for me to uh, look into. Again, I can imagine that it would help with potentially the coordination and also provide a little bit more on that uh, the stability uh, for you as well. I was just going to mention um, for everyone in this area, I'm not sure if everyone's aware that we do have occupational therapy home visits throughout Lambton County, and they're free visits that anyone can ask for. And part of the program, um, it's through the Grand Bend Area Community Health Centre or the uh, North Lambton Community Health Centre, and part of that program does install free grab bars. So you have to have that OT home assessment done, but you can refer yourself to those programs. Great. Thank you. And that, that, is, that is a very important point to have, and I would highly encourage you... Um, to take that to take that up and have somebody have an occupational therapist come in do a home assessment and really walk through because every everybody is different everybody has different abilities and every home is different so really they, they're going to have to come up with some creative solutions and if that service is available um, I think that's fantastic and you should uh, definitely uh, take that opportunity Can you tell us where we can get a commercially available laser queue and what they would be in cost-wise? Yeah, so that one in particular was the mobile laser, it's called. Um, let's find it here. Here we are, and, there, and there's a picture of it on that top. The top right, it is just quite a small portable device. It's purchased through a company called Proto Kinetics. I believe it's P-R-O-T-O-K-I-N-E-T-I-C-S. Um, Proto Kinetics. If you if you look look up mobile laser, uh, it will come up. Um, they're not inexpensive. Uh, they're around four hundred dollars. Um, you know, again, talking and again, I'm not a uh, endorsing that company. They just it, it happens to be, I believe, the only device on the market that uh, that is portable. So this this can attach onto any. It just has a clip that gets attached on to either a walker or a cane. You can buy if you use both devices. You can buy um, multiple clips, and it just unclips and clips back on, and it has a magnet involved that actually acts, activates the uh, the laser once it's uh, once it's turned on. Um, there are other walkers. The U Step, I believe, is another walker that has this built right in. It actually also has an auditory component, so it, it uh, produces a metronome uh, that works as an auditory or rhythmic auditory stimulation. And again, that's the entire higher walker though and that's I believe they're around $800 the walkers um, and I don't know whether they are covered you, you can certainly talk to an occupational therapist who's um, in partnership with the assistive devices program so there are some funding uh, available and that the government does provide I believe up to around 75% of funding but I don't know the the regulations uh, per se that are involved with that whether a U step would be covered or whether it would be just a, a, a traditional uh, sort of rollator walker um, the other thing to consider is that, again, lasers have come down in price considerably. You can go to the dollar store, um, to be quite honest, and for, for a couple dollars, almost fashion your own laser, especially just to give it a try, even if you want to hold it in your hand as you walk, um, to, get, to give that a try before investing in, in a, in a $400 um, laser. The nice thing that I will say with this one is that it is portable, so that you can put it on your cane, your walker, move it around. I'm sure you can rig something up to have it put on your belt clip as well, that if you don't use a cane or a walker and that you still would like the uh, the advantage of increasing your step length and that to be able to use, I'm sure it can clip on your belt clip somehow. But it has an articulating head. Um, so that's this thing. You just you just loosen this nut up and that head swivels so that you can put it in the, uh, in the proper position. So how you may attach it to your walker or cane might be different to somebody else's walker. Um, I don't know if there's an optimal. Everybody sort of has their own. I might might defer that question to Dr. Jenkins. Do you know? Because I know you're talking a little bit more about gait today. Everyone has everyone has their own optimal cadence rate, but the cadence in in Parkinson's doesn't usually change. So the cadence so cadence is the number of steps. Yes, it's the step length that 
will change. So it's it is it is individual to each person, but there are approximate values in people with Parkinson's still stay in that same average. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your attention. And uh, I don't know, I think it's a uh, break time, is it? A little bit of a break. Thank you so much.